ladies. We are so excited to kick off our monthly Eras gatherings. We love that you are joining us for a night of prayer and worship and ministry. We know that God is gonna do amazing things in your homes tonight, wherever you're watching from. We love that you're joining us and we can't wait to see what God is gonna do. We want to hear from you this evening. Let us know that you're watching by dropping a comment in the chat box. Tell us where you're watching from. We are so excited about our growing global sisterhood and wanna be able to communicate with you this evening. Now, as we enter this new chapter of Arise, we've been praying for you We've been praying for this ministry, and I believe that God is taking us back to our roots as Christians. You know, when Jesus spent his time in ministry here on earth, he spent much of his time in the homes of people who sought him, bringing healing, forgiveness, restoration. And I believe that when we seek him and we prepare our hearts, that he will step into our homes, step into our situations, and bring healing where there has been pain, forgiveness where we have been ravaged by shame, restoration where things have laid dormant, and revival where we have been dead. And I believe that that is exactly what we're gonna see when we join together in the homes of our sisters and worship the Lord together. Now, if at any point during this evening you need prayer, you can actually click the request prayer button and it will bring you into a private chat with one of our prayer partners and we will join with you and seek the face of God on your behalf. Ladies, we know that when we seek God, that we do not come to him from the posture of an orphan that has to beg for scraps, but that of a daughter who when we ask, he gives us exceedingly and abundantly more. And I believe that is exactly what he is gonna do in your heart and the hearts of those around you this evening. So lean in, prepare your heart, and let's get ready to worship. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life, all over history Your faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your
promises in fulfillment all of my life, all of my life. I see the evidence of your goodness all of I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything And more than anything That you can do I just want you I'll sing that again Caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave But I'm not here for blessing Jesus, you don't owe me anything And more than anything that you can do I just want you And I'm sorry and I've just gone through the motions But I'm sorry When I just sang another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you And I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda God, I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you Oh, I'm caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Lord, I'm not here for blessings And Jesus, you don't owe me I just want you. We'll make this your prayer right where you're at. I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do 
I just want you and nothing else and nothing else and nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else and nothing else and nothing else will do I just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else will do I'm caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Lord I'm not here for blessings cause Jesus you don't I just want you Cause you you're the only thing that's going to satisfy nothing on this earth nothing is going to satisfy like you you're the only one eternal the only one that will satisfy so I pray that you would open our hearts tonight to all that you want to speak to us to walk into all that you have for us because you have good plans Every good and perfect gift comes from you, our Father in love. So, Lord, we just commit this time to you. Pray you'd move in our hearts. 
Move in every heart, every home, every place where people are gathering. Meet them there, because when two or three are gathered in your name, you are there with them. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. How can we creatively teach children important biblical concepts before they are lost to an entire generation? The answer is the way Jesus did, with parables. The Good King is a parable about the incarnation of Christ, or God becoming one of us to save us all. Help children to understand and experience the magnitude of the selfless love of Jesus, our Good King. Twelve vibrant illustrations and a dramatized narration with sound effects will immerse children in this epic tale, sparking meaningful conversations. Also included is a Let's Talk discussion guide for parents and kids and notes for further study. Children can understand deep spiritual truths. If only, we will be diligent to teach them. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation. The Good King is available now on MelodyHolly.com or Amazon. is awakening. Hawaii is awakening. South Carolina is awakening. Florida is awakening. Chicago, Louisiana, Canada is awakening. Las Vegas, Iowa, Alabama is awakening. Southern California, St. Louis, Brazil, Colorado is awakening. New York is awakening. Georgia, Kentucky, Charleston, Bulgaria is awakening. Israel is awakening. Mississippi, San Francisco, West Virginia, the earth is awake. Well, good evening, good evening, girls. I'm so excited uh, to gather again. I know conference weekend was absolutely amazing, and I have um, just enjoyed hearing your stories about how God has met you in your homes. And I know this has been an insane year. And it's so beautiful to watch true faith sort of bud from all of the chaos and just women leaning in and realizing that where two or three are gathered, he's in their midst. And so I'm hoping that you're gathering tonight with some friends. I know that we had people at conference from all over the world, literally. I think we have um, a list of some places um, where you were gathering all over the world from Florida, Texas, Hawaii, Nevada, South Carolina, Georgia, Minnesota, Oregon, um, all of the United States, and then also in the world, throughout the world, lots of other places too, Honduras, Canada, Swaziland, Germany, the Dominican, Israel, Bulgaria. Actually, something kind of funny, our pastor's wife from Swaziland, she had a baby, her first child, and then I think like two days later hosted the Arise Gathering um, for a conference, and they just had an amazing turnout. Um, just so beautiful to celebrate with you. I know I really felt like the Lord had given me a word that there would be miraculous healings in the homes um, as people were really activated in their gift to make disciples. And we saw that. We saw um, women being delivered, um, women 
I've heard stories of women who were on the brink of suicide and God rescued them that weekend and miraculous healing and salvations and restorations. And many of you express that um, this was the most intimate, the most powerful conference that you've experienced to date. And so I'm excited because this isn't a one-time thing that we do, that we gather on a special weekend, but really a process. We want to re-normalize having church in our homes and to gathering together. I thought it was pretty interesting that this morning, the verse of the day on you version was where two or three are gathered, I'm in their midst. And actually, we're going to talk about that tonight, um, just the simplicity of devotion to Christ that's not dependent on buildings, on on hype, on formulas, and just reorienting ourselves to a simple devotion to Christ. And so I actually invited um, a couple of my friends. Um, I, we have one I asked her to sit up here with me, and she was like, oh, no, I don't want the camera on me. So I uh, didn't want to make her feel awkward, but I asked just a, uh, you know, a friend here, and then, of course, my team um, is here. So you might hear a couple of amens. And so we're gathering, and, you know, I, I think this is the lowest attended ever arise um, gathering of one. And so we have one uh, friend. And But I love how beautiful this is that where two or three are gathered, he promises he's right there in their midst. And so um, we're just going to take just a moment. I know we just finished praying, but I want to take just a moment again just to, to settle our hearts to hear from him. I know there's lots of distractions that can come up in a home with kids. And, um, and I know before conference weekend, you, you prepared for that. You, you ramped up for that. And so I just want to take a little extra time before we jump into this word. I'm excited to share with you what the Lord has laid on my heart. And so I want to take just a second and let's just welcome the Lord into our hearts, make our home a sanctuary. Why don't you just lift your hands in your home right now? Father, we thank you. What a beautiful Savior. What a beautiful faith. That, Lord, all we need is you. All we need is two or three gathered in the name of Jesus. And that you're right here in our homes. And we make our homes a sanctuary. And I pray for peace over every home, over every child that may be in the room watching that there would be no distractions. And God, we welcome you and we prepare our hearts. God, we don't want a one-time experience, a one-time encounter with you, Father. We want to devote our lives in pursuit of you. And I believe there's a hunger and a thirst for righteousness as we watch all of the things, all of the uncertainty that's come upon the globe, Father. You are reorienting our heart to yours. And as there's a fear that's crept across the globe with this uncertainty, one thing is certain, and that's your love. That's your word. And so we dedicate this time. God, we love you. God, we love you. And we welcome you now. And we welcome you now in our hearts, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you. And right now, God is just bringing peace before the words even spoken. Peace to someone's heart. Someone, the Spirit of the Lord would say, Martha, Martha, you are distracted over many things and just one thing's necessary. So, Father, give us Mary's heart to sit at your feet, to hear from our beloved Savior, to want you more than anything else, and to let everything else go that doesn't matter, that's temporal, and to behold you, to look at our Savior's face right now, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. We thank you. Well, I want to talk to you girls tonight. Um, I hope you have notes. We are going to have some discussion questions after for you to either personally reflect or hopefully talk to a few friends about. Um, so I'm praying that the Lord will speak to you as he did to me. And this message actually just came out of my quiet time, and I thought it was just for me. 
Um, when I go to the Word, I don't go to look for messages. I go really um, to search my own heart and to, Father, what are you speaking to me? So when I came upon this verse that I'm about to show you, um, I got really excited because I was like, this is my whole purpose in life. This is what I'm called to do. And then I felt like the Lord gently prompted me that this was not just a me word. This was a we word. This was for all of us um, and that he wanted me to share it with you. So I'm very excited. Um, and so I'm going to introduce a verse to you. But first, I want to tell you, this past weekend, I had the privilege of of um, going to a conference in Louisiana of a small church that I actually grew up in. And so um, my pastor's wife as a teenager, she was actually my pastor's wife from a small girl. Um, and then uh, I grew up in that church until I got married. And she unexpectedly passed away from a brain tumor that was found uh, last minute. She was young and, um, and really didn't last very long after they found it. And so she hosted a women's conference every single year. And her daughter called me and she said, listen, um, Mom felt like we needed to still have this conference, and we can think of nobody else that would better honor her. Would you come and speak at this conference in her memory? And so how do you say no to that? Um, so I put on my mask, and I went down um, to Louisiana, you know, braving the risk of not only getting corona, but getting Cajun rona. I said it would be like a spicy version of rona if I got it there. So um, I swabbed before I went, masked up, and, um, and went to Louisiana, and um, and actually, I shared this word with them, but it was such a beautiful um, time to watch as this church was grieving the loss of Miss Lolly. But me personally, just remembering, I actually ran away from that church, not kidding, like ran away from the church during a revival when I was 16, went missing for three days, got arrested. I know I'm a hot mess, y'all. And, um, and God used this church when I was really in a path of just self-destruction. Um, God used this woman to restore me. And so it was beautiful just to be there. But the theme of their conference was first love. And I thought about this, um, this call to return to our first love. And so actually what we're going to talk about tonight is a simple devotion. But one of the things I brought a friend with me, and one of the things that I told them is that, you know, when I, my Louisiana friends come to West Virginia to visit, we sight C. I, I, I tell my Louisiana, let's go sight C. And there are um, waterfalls. If you've never been, come visit us. It's absolutely beautiful here. Waterfalls and mountains and um, absolutely beautiful. So we sightsee. I sightsee with my Louisiana friends in West Virginia. But when I bring West Virginia friends to Louisiana, we sight eat. So there's not much to look at except for swamps, but there's a lot to eat. And there's nobody quite on the planet that can cook like a Cajun can cook. And so people come, not kidding, from all over the world um, to Louisiana just to taste the food. It is an eclectic mix of just rich um, cuisine. And so you better bring your fat pants if you ever visit Louisiana. People ask me, are you a good cook? And I'm like, well, it depends. I am a West Virginia four. I'm sorry, I'm in a West Virginia eight, but a Louisiana four. And so it depends on where it is. But in Louisiana, they have something called the Holy Trinity of Cajun cuisine. And that consists of onions, bell peppers, and celery. And so they literally, they nickname it the Holy Trinity of Cajun cooking. Um, and it's because every Cajun authentic dish just about starts with these three recipes. And what I want to show you tonight is if we're talking about a simple devotion to the Lord, you know, sometimes I think we complicate things too much. We make things a little too um, unnecessarily complex when Christianity is very simple. And there is a simple devotion between God and us. And I want to show you another holy trinity out of Ezra that I came upon in my quiet time. Um, Ezra chapter 7, verse 9. It says this. This is Ezra saying, For the gracious hand of God was on him. Sorry, this is the Lord saying about Ezra. For the gracious hand of his God was on him. Now, before I go any further, how many of you would be willing, you can say, oh, yeah, from your couch. Are you, you want the gracious hand of God on you. If that's you, say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I want the gracious hand. I've got somebody from the back in the, the sound booth saying, yes, me. We want the gracious hand of God on us. We want to be like in Psalm 1 where it says, blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord and in, he meditates day and night. And it says that his tree will always produce fruit that it will produce fruit in each season. Whatever he does will prosper. And I don't know about you, but I would like the gracious hand of God on my family, on my marriage, on our church, on everything I set my hands to endeavor. And I believe that God wants the great, his gracious hand to be upon your life. And so I, what I'm about to show you is what I believe the Holy Trinity, the ingredients, those three main ingredients for how do I tap into the gracious hand of God like Ezra on my life. 
Um, it's about to tell us why this was on him. In verse 10, it says, this was because Ezra had determined to study, obey the law of the Lord, and to teach those decrees and regulations to the people of Israel. I'm going to read that one more time. Verse 10. The gracious hand of God was on him because Ezra had determined to study, obey the law of the Lord, and to teach those decrees and regulations to the people of Israel. And when I read this, my spirit just leaped. I was like, yes, this is my calling. This is what God has called me to do. But I really felt like as I began to ponder and meditate on this, that actually the Lord was saying, this is what we're all called to do. And so I want to show you, I'm going to give you a synapse of everything that we're going to discuss tonight, and I won't keep you long, um, and then I'll let you guys talk about this. But um, I want to show you what happens when we only have two of these and not all three ingredients. Okay. So first, if we obey and we teach, but we don't study, there's heresy. If we study and we teach, but we don't obey, there's hypocrisy. And if we study and we obey, but we don't teach, there's infertility. And so, you know, in Ecclesiastes, it says that two are better than one. And so maybe you're just doing two of these. Maybe you are doing, that's better than one. I mean, I'm glad that you're doing two. Oh, but a three-strand cord. There's something powerful and potent about activating all three of these ingredients in our walk to see the gracious hand of God. And so let's, let's dive into these just a minute. Let's talk first about what would happen if we obey what does happen if we obey and teach, but we don't study? And I'm going to break this open even more. Um, I told you if you obey and you teach, but you don't study, there'll be heresy. And what I mean by that is when we do this, it creates bad theology. And it makes us vulnerable to deception. It makes us vulnerable to deception. You know, it says in Scripture that in the end times, there's going to be um, a wave of deception, people that are going to, a great falling away, that people that are going to be blown around by every wind of doctrine. And so we want to make sure that we go to the scriptures ourselves, ourselves to know what it says. We are commanded to be students of God's word. And I'm going to show you this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says, study, can you say study? study and do your best to present yourself to God approved. Now this is saying do your best to present to, to God approved. A workman tested by trial who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. Now maybe you think I don't have anybody that I teach. I don't influence anyone. I'm not a Bible teacher, but you are actually influencing those around you. When you give your input and you weigh in on people's issues that are going on in their lives, when you give advice to your friends, are you giving them godly advice? Are you giving them sound biblical advice? And so it's important that if you bear the name of Christ because people are going to see you and they're going to come to you for counsel that you accurately divide the word of God that you actually know what it says and you're giving them truth and not just a version of truth or your perception of truth, but the actual truth of the word of God. And I think for a lot of us, we've made the mistake of just assuming we know what the Bible says instead of really truly knowing what the Bible says. In Acts 17, 11, there's a group of people called the Bereans, and I love these guys. Um, it says about them, now these people were more noble and open-minded than those in Thessalonica. So they received the message of salvation through faith in Christ with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. You know, a good Bible teacher is not going to be intimidated by you going and researching what they just taught. As a matter of fact, a good Bible teacher will encourage you to go to the scriptures for yourself and examine them daily to see if these things are so because the word of God is not ambiguous. It's not, it's, it's very plain. It's very direct. And I'm confident if you go to the scripture for yourselves, not to a commentary, not just to podcast, these are all wonderful things, but there we cannot neglect going to God's word for ourselves. Now, I have four kids, and I'm one of six kids. I have four. I'm, one, I'm the fourth daughter out of five, 
And we love some hand-me-downs. How many of you love hand-me-downs? I mean, it saves some money. But now I have a 16-year-old daughter and a 4-year-old daughter. And what would happen if I only depended on hand-me-downs in our home and I never went and bought things just for little Che? If I only gave her things passed down from Eden, passed down from Zia, all the way down for 12 years, guess what would happen? Her clothes would all be stained. They'd all be torn. They'd all be ripped up. And listen, we cannot survive and clothe ourselves with hand-me-down theology. We have to have direct revelation from the Holy Spirit, and this is by pursuing him for ourselves. Otherwise, if we depended only on what's been passed down from other people, what's been taught from someone else, regurgitated theology, if that's all we depend on, then our lives are gonna start to tear apart at the seam because it's not meant to get surrogately. It's not meant for you to go to God through me. Now listen, if you're just newly saved, of course you want someone to come alongside of you and to help you and to help you accurately understand context as you're studying. But listen, if you've been saved for 15 years, 10 years, 7 years, 8 years, you shouldn't need me to completely exposit the word of God for you. You should have an eagerness and a hunger to go to him yourself. You know, I want you to think about for a minute the fact that Satan arms himself with one or two scriptures pulled out of context. Think about how Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness. He did it with the word of God. It's not enough to know one or two random scriptures and to pull them out and broadband apply them to your life. That's how you get into cultic kind of practices where people get off in bad theology. You need to recognize bad theology when you hear it. And how do you do that? It's by studying the original. You know, when people are studying to find out uh, to be counterfeit inspectors with with money. They actually never touch a counterfeit bill. They only handle the original. They smell it, they touch it, they feel it. And by handling this so much, they instantly know and are aware when they're handed a fake. And with pervasive deception creeping across the globe now more than ever, we have to confidently study the word of God daily for ourselves, handling it, and so that we can instantly recognize when something is off. You know, in Matthew 15, Jesus is talking about um, people who have only just passed down, hand-me-down theology and the result in that. And it says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Man-made ideas as commands from God. You know, even traditions, this word comes from kind of the idea of passing something down over and over. And traditions are not bad in and of themselves. But when we start to more communicate and more pass down man-made ideas just because we've seen another leader do it or because our, our grandmother or our grandpa or our mom or our dad told us this is what the word of God says, this is when we really get into straying from simple devotion to God. You know, this word farce is an interesting word. It's actually literally means a comic dramatic work using buffoonery and horseplay. When we're acting and we're playing like we're Christians, but really we're play acting ideas that were written by man and not by God. And I want you to listen to this. Jesus says this, he's, he's lamenting. And he says in Matthew 11, what can I compare this generation? They're like children sitting in the marketplaces calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. In other words, Jesus is saying, what are you doing? And I think sometimes if we're honest and we look at our walk, or especially in, a, in the western half of the globe with this um, complacent walk of Americans, if you look at the American church, I believe the Spirit of God would say, what are you doing? You're playing a game. You're dancing the dance. You're calling my name. But really, when we look at our lives, we don't actually, aren't actually holding up the word of God to it and doing what it says. I'm spilling coffee and doing all kinds of stuff up here, y'all. You know, I was sitting at the table the other day with my four-year-old, and um, she was super hungry, and I was super hungry. It had been one of those days where I had barely eaten because I was, like, working a lot that day. And, um, and so we're sitting at the table, and she's being really dramatic and really irrational, and, um, and I'm just trying to get some food in my mouth because at this point, I'm hangry. I get, like, jittery and not nice and snippy. And so, um, and so she's wanting, she's like, Mommy, I need you to feed me. I need you to 
feed me. I'm like, baby, I am hungry. I want to eat my own food. And she's like, no, mommy, I need you to feed me. Please do this. Please do the choo-choo train. Please do the airplane. And I'm like, baby, you are old enough to feed yourself. I am not spoon feeding you. Well, she held up a fork. She said, it's not spoon feeding. It's fork feeding. But, you know, I had a friend that uh, actually sat, sat across from me, and she really meant this with a pure heart. But she said, you know, I've never been discipled. I've been coming to church for a while, but I've never truly been discipled. I was like, well, what do you mean by that? Because I look at your life, and I see where you've definitely come more toward Christ, where God's healing your marriage and your parenting. She's like, well, I've never, like, systematically gone through Scripture and learned theology and systematic theology. And so I leaned in, and I knew she was truly just hungry and wanting the Word of God. And I said, let me ask you a question. Whose responsibility is that? Is that the church's or do we assume our responsibility of it's my job to be a student, a lifelong student of the word of God? Not only if I'm called to ministry, but if I'm called to be a Christian, to bear the name of Christ, then I am charged to look like Christ in all things, to know him and to understand his word. As a matter of fact, Christ is the word made flesh. So if I want to know Christ, if I'm going to bear the name of Christ and walk in his ways and be a disciple, that means disciplined in the way of the Lord, then I, it's my responsibility to feed myself. And I have to be a, I have to be a self-feeder. I can't depend. It's, again, it's one thing if you're a new Christian, but it's another thing if we go through life and we expect pastors to spoon feed us everything, leaders, podcasts to spoon feed us everything. This is how bad theology creeps in because the scriptures say that in the end times, people are going to go looking for someone to tickle their ears, looking for words to tell them what they want to hear. And it's the, it's the daily dividing of the scripture for ourselves, holding the word of God and examining our hearts, studying it for ourselves that keeps us from erring in deception. And I think in the American church especially, we have misinterpreted the responsibility of the church. We've misinterpreted. When you come and you hear a message from me, really it should be confirming already what God has been speaking to you in your quiet time. It should confirm and clarify. God's already been speaking some of these truths to you, and this is putting clarity to some of it. It shouldn't be there. And maybe there's a nugget here and there, but really it should be provoking you to get in the word yourself, clarifying that and encouraging you in it. You know, I can give you all the meat. I mean, I can, I can feed you with deep spiritual truths, but if you're still a baby in Christ, you're not gonna be able to eat it. And I hear so many people, well, that, I didn't like that song, and I didn't like that message, and you hear these people that go from church to church because that wasn't deep enough, and I just need the deep spiritual things, and yet they're not even really applying or studying or understanding basic elements. And you hear this frustration with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. He said he couldn't. He wanted to. He wanted to give them deep spiritual truths, but he couldn't. I had to talk to you as though you belonged to the world or as that you were infants in Christ. And I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger and you still aren't ready. In other words, we can't give you milk, we can't give you meat if you're still burping up milk. And so we have to self-prepare that I'm going to go to the word of God myself. I'm gonna see this as my personal responsibility as a Christian to be a student of the word of God for the rest of my life. Do you want to know how I learned theology? Do you want to know how, why I signed up to, lo to, to learn Hebrew and to study Hebrew? It was a self-desire inside of me long before I was a pastor that I decided I want to know God for myself. I don't want someone else to tell me. I want to see him with my own eyes. I want to touch him with my own hands. I want to feel him speak directly to my heart. And God is calling each of us to do that. Psalm 1 says this, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. You hear that? The gracious hand of God will be on you if you determine to study these things. 1 Timothy 4.15 says, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them. So 
how I do this practically is I get in the word. It is my priority. Every morning I get up and it's the first thing that I do. And I go through the scripture with a one-year Bible. I love a one-year Bible. I personally use New Living Translation. I'm just giving you a tool, not telling you you have to do this, but I'm giving you a tool. And I get in the New Living because I believe it's a good thought-for-thought translation to help me understand the whole picture of the narrative of the gospel. And I have my journal and I talk to the Lord and then I read and I'll write scriptures that stick out. Even if I don't know why this scripture stuck out to me, I'll write it down because I'm able to go back and look at it later. And sometimes God shows me something. Um, he's, something's like an onion, and he's, he's pulling back layer after layer, revealing his word, revealing wisdom to me. And so I journal these things, and I pray. And this is every single day. And what can happen if you commit to doing this every day? You know, it takes me about 15 minutes to read my one-year Bible. And so if you do this every day in 15 years, you would have read the scriptures all the way through 15 times. And actually, I've, the past few years, I've started reading two a day. So if you read, if you read two days each day, 30 times in 15 years you could have read the scriptures. Be a student of the word for yourself. In Ephesians 4 it says, um, we need to become, we need to grow spiritually to become mature believers, reaching to the measure of the fullness of Christ, manifesting his spiritual completeness, and exercising our spiritual gifts in unity, so that we are no longer children, spiritually immature, tossed back and forth like ships on a stormy sea, and carried about by every wind of shifting doctrine. By the cunning and trickery of unscrupulous men, the deceitful scheming of people ready to do anything for personal profit, but speaking the truth in love in all things, both our speech and our lives, expressing his truth, let us grow up in all things into him, following his example, who is the head, Christ. So let me ask you this. Are you doing your best to present yourself to God and accurately divide the truth? Are you doing your personal best don't blame shift. Don't blame your pastor. Don't blame your parents. Are you currently, we can't do anything about yesterday, but will you currently determine, I will do my best to study the scripture for myself. Turn to the girl next to you, and I'm going to look at you, Ashley, and say, grow up. Grow up. It's time to grow up. All right, so that's what happens if we um, obey and we teach, but we don't study. But let's look now at what happens if we study and we teach, but we don't obey. If we study and we teach what we don't obey, it brings hypocrisy. And honestly, this brings shame and reproach upon the name of Christ. When we only study and we only teach, but we fail to see that I need this personally for my own life. You know, in Revelation, it says that when the angel gave the scroll to John the Revelator, it said it was sweet in his mouth, but sour in his stomach. And isn't this true about the word of God? It sure is sweet to quote that scripture to somebody else and to tell somebody else what they need to do, but man, it's sour and we have to digest it for our own selves. And so this is a problem, a chronic problem in the church is that we, are, we know way beyond what we obey. And that we know about scripture and we know what to do, but somehow we justify that maybe I get an exemption for my particular situation. And it's easy to point the finger, but honestly, this brings great reproach onto the name of Christ. And I see a lot of pastors and a lot of people that when they read the word of God in the morning, they're already thinking about who needs to hear this. Anybody willing to admit, mm, you know you have, that you sometimes will read the scripture and instead of first holding it up to your own heart, you're thinking about who needs to read this and who you need to text this scripture to. Now, there's nothing wrong with texting scripture to somebody or sending a message to somebody that moves you. But our first response needs to be, God, what are you trying to speak to me? You're trying to realign my heart. Have I fully obeyed you in all of this? You know, in Proverbs 4.13, it says, to take hold of my instructions. Don't let them go. Guard them. They are the key to your life. You know, people go all over the world wanting to see, what's the key to life? What is the, what is the meaning to life? Can I tell you the key to life is holding on to the word of God. The word of God says that he's already given us everything we need for life and godliness. It's found in the scriptures. You know, I think sometimes we think that these laws that God has given us, these commands that God has given us, first of all, sometimes we think they're optional, they're suggestions, but they're not, they're commands. But then I think sometimes we think they're just a bunch of random rules that God has made up on the fly just to see if we're like good monkeys and can do some tricks. 
Come on, monkey, do these tricks. How, how, when well, you're going to obey this, you're going to obey this. Good boy, good boy, like a little puppy, and I'll give you a little treat. And actually, that's so far from the heart of God. You know, I heard a song that said, I'm beginning to find that these boundary lines were meant for me that I might find all of the treasure hidden inside a holy God. Now, I want you to think about this. Boundary lines of the word of God, that they're like a fence, And perhaps God is not saying, I'm trying to keep you here like the mom from Tangled. You know, mother knows best. Listen to your mama for selfish purposes. God is actually showing us where the boundary lines are because there's treasure of abundant life found within the boundary lines of the command of Scripture. And when we go out from that boundary line, we're only causing self-inflicted pain. We're hurting those around us. And listen, we're hurting the name of Christ. When we shout out the commands of God without actually obeying them, this is causing great shame to the name of Christ. And we have to personally be responsible that I'm not going to teach to someone else what I haven't obeyed personally. You know, I think it's funny because every time I preach a message, I have to live it. Like every single time. As a matter of fact, there was one particular time that we were preaching on suffering and some different things. And, man, we were suffering. And I told Brandon, I'm going to stop preaching. I realize I have to live whatever I preach. So I'm going to stop preaching on suffering, and I'm going to start preaching on living young and being thin. Like, that's what I'm going to, being young, never aging. Because, man, God requires, I'm not going to just let you teach this. You're going to have to live this. But do you know it's like exercising a muscle? That's one thing for me to watch a workout video. <laughs> But watching it doesn't actually change my body frame. It doesn't actually change and make me stronger and healthier. I have to actually do it. But something beautiful happens when we obey the truths that we've just read and studied, that we begin to exercise. And now when I go to teach somebody, I have compassion for them because I know how hard that was. It's one thing to point the finger and say, you need to do this. But when you've had to live and swallow hard truth, man, you hand it out with much more grace. And it gives power that you've said, I've lived this. I've done this. I'm telling you, this works. Hold on because God is for you. You can preach it and teach it with power and potency and passion. But please hear me. When we operate in sloppy agape, when we use the grace of God as an excuse or an out for sin, what we are doing is trampling on the blood of Jesus. When we hold up the banner and the covenant of God and claim to be Christians and yet defy him privately in our own lives to the, to the watching world, we are showing that what we are saying is this is no different than every other religion. If we really truly believe this, then we have to obey this. And some of us, We have an obedience problem. And, you know, if we listen to my kids and my kids say, you know, oh, mommy, I love you. Okay, listen, I need you to go clean your room because we have somebody come over. I want you to clean your room. Okay, I will. But first, I just want to snuggle and look into your eyes and tell you how beautiful I am, how you are. (laughs) And what are you going to tell that kid? Get in your room. Go clean that room. I don't want your love right now. Go do what I said. And I think a lot of you, we have, we have, extravagant shows of affection for God and doing these elaborate things when, is that really what God wants? Or does he just want us to obey? Because remember Jesus' words, he said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Do you hear the father heart of God saying, if you love me, then trust me. Because obedience is really rooted in a faith problem. I want to back this up for a minute. Some of you don't just have an obedience problem, you actually have a faith problem. Because if you believe that something works, you do it. You obey. If I believe that the shower is going to turn from cold water to hot water, I will stand in the shower until the hot water comes out. But if I believe the hot water is broken, I will get out of that shower. And so listen, if you're not obeying the word of God, chances are it's not actually an obedience problem. It's a faith problem. How do we get more faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. This is why we have to study. And then as we study, as we immerse ourselves in these things, we begin to obey out of faith, out of faith. But listen to this, Amos chapter five. I hate all your show and pretense. This is harsh. I hate all your show and pretense. This is God. God's saying this. I hate all your show and pretense. The hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. Now listen. We just hosted a a conference. But I'm going to tell you, I believe part of the shutdown globally for the church is God reorienting us that he doesn't need grand gestures. He doesn't need huge religious assemblies apart from personal, private devotion. 
that he wants us to get back to the simple devotion of truly loving him and truly trusting him with our lives. And if we love him, we will obey. He says, I will not accept your burnt offerings or your grain offerings. I won't even notice your choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice, an endless river of righteous living. He wants us to obey. He echoes this. This gets, and I didn't write this. Don't like send me a nasty email. This is straight scripture in Isaiah Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. The incense of your offerings disgusts me. As for your celebrations of the new moon and Sabbath, your special days for fasting, they are sinful and false. I want no more of your pious meetings. I hate your new moon celebrations and your annual festivals. They are a burden to me. I cannot stand them. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I won't look. Though you offer many prayers, I won't listen. Now this is heartbreaking. Do you sense the heart of God saying, stop it? It's like a husband who comes home and tells you how devoted he is for you and buys you gifts, but in behind the scenes, you know he's sleeping with other women doesn't mean anything. If you don't have the full devotion from that man, then stop buying me gifts. Stop coming home and telling me how lovely I am. Stop posting about how much you love me when you've got something going on on the side. And when you haven't truly said, forsaking all others, I'll commit myself to you. And listen, this is true devotion, that forsaking all others, that he is first and preeminent, that we have covenanted ourselves to him and that we will follow him alone. And so this is what we have to do. We have to study and we have to obey. But listen, this is a part that I really want to focus this last portion of this message on because it's so important. And listen, some of you, God is convicting you about truly getting in the word and being a student. Some of you, God is committing about things that you have not obeyed him in. But I want to shift for just a moment. I think this is so relevant for us as we're meeting in homes tonight. If we study and we obey, but we don't teach, there's infertility. What I mean, that this kind of walk with God will foster short-term impact only. And your life will leave no lasting legacy unless you share the seed of the word of God in someone else. You know, I watched that conference this weekend as I sat and shared with these women. And I thought about my life as a 16-year-old girl set on a path of self-destruction. And at that particular moment in my life when I ran away from home and I actually came back, um, I was arrested. They brought me back to this little church. And um, I had... But I was hungover and I was still high on acid, so I was having a bad trip and I was like seeing demons in my vomit. I know I was. A, I told you I was a hot mess. I mean, like I was to- being tormented. This was days of of experiencing hallucinations that were very demonic. I, I'm convinced I was seeing. I had an open veil to the, some of the demonic activity that was going on right in my sphere as the, the enemy was warring for my soul. And I had scabs completely covering my upper lip from where I had cried so much and wiped my face so much that it was scabbed over. I was ashamed. I was broken. And I came back to the church, and people loved me, and I was just just almost, like, stoic, like, hard. And the next couple of weeks, I didn't, I was home, but I didn't really come home. I was um, in a very, very dark place, and I would dyed my hair black, and I put on all black makeup just to spite my mom. And um, you know how 16-year-olds are. <laughs> And, you know, black, you know, I was just, just decking myself. I would take a whole bottle of pills before I'd go to church. And I remember Miss Lolly looking at me and she said, Melody, you're home, but you're not home. And it wasn't long after that from the prayers of my parents that this prodigal came home broken to the Lord and rededicating my life. But I realized that I had to change some things who I was hanging around. And All of my friends, I looked around at school and there was no one, even the valedictorian, there was no one I knew that wasn't doing drugs. There was no one that I knew that wasn't partying. And so I was home. And so I decided that Miss Lolly and her friends, Miss Carla and Miss Glenda, who were leaders in the church, they were in their 40s, that they would be my 40-year-old best friends. And so my senior year, I hung out with 40-year-olds and we would pray in the evenings and we would talk And I really, truly can say to this day with full confidence that on the path that I was on, had Miss Lolly not stepped in my life, I would not be sitting here. I I was so suicidal. I was so on the brink of the end of my own self 
I would not have made it had a mother not stepped in, seen this spiritually orphaned girl and brought her in close to her and made room for me. And I'm going to tell you, we're in a generation where we have many teachers, but we don't have many mothers. We don't have many fathers. This is not a pastor's call. This is all of our call to see those around us who need someone just to organically do life with them. I'm not telling you to have a Bible study, although some of you, God may be calling you to truly disciple people. I'm calling you to ask women around you, girls around you to see them, some, some of you children around you to see them and to bring them close, to love them and nurture them, to share the gospel of Jesus. Listen to this in Matthew 28. Verse 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. This is not a commission. This is called the Great Commission. And it wasn't given to the fivefold ministry. This was given to all Christians were called to make disciples. And let me tell you what's going to happen. Miss Lolly's life was planted in the ground like a seed. She didn't die. She planted her life like a seed. And every woman that I reach was because that woman took me in her home. Every person that is impacted by my lives and the lives of my children is because of that woman who saw me when I desperately needed someone to mother me. Can we see those around us who need us? Your life will outlive you. And her life is rippling into eternity long after she's seen Jesus and she's finished her race. Her legacy is living on because of simple, simple acts of just bringing someone close. Titus tells us the older women must train the younger women. It's a command. We must. Do you hear the imperative? We must. We must. We must train those around us. We must share the gospel. We can't just eat this for ourselves and not tell everyone around, I found the key to life. I found the hope of the world. And listen, let me tell you, you do not have to be perfect to do this. I I'm not perfect in the areas that I preach, not by a long shot. Sometimes I teach them with compassion and gentleness because I have just recently messed up in one of those areas. We fail for it. The scripture says a righteous man falls seven times and he won't be hurled headlong for the Lord holds him up by his right hand. Listen, it's just a matter of we just keep swimming like Dory. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Just focus our heart on the Lord. You know, we had Christmas a few years ago and I think we have that. Brandon's grandmother. Brandon, how old is she now? She's 82 now. And so his grandfather had just recently passed. And so I decided that I wanted to really just bless her and get her a nice gift. We normally have a budget for all of our Christmas gifts. And and so I was like, I want to splurge on her something super nice. And the poor woman doesn't go anywhere. Like she's a homebody. And so she stays in home a lot. So she likes lounge wear and sleeping wear. And so I actually found this robe and it's super soft and nice. And it was a pretty little penny. And I gave, we bought this. I said, Brandon, can we splurge on this? I really want to bless her this year. So at Christmas morning, Christmas evening, sorry, when we were opening gifts, she opens this gift and I was super excited just to watch her open it. And she opens the gift and she looks at it and she was like, I don't want that. You can take that back. (laughs) And I was like, huh? She's like, I don't want that. You can take that back. I was like, what? (laughs) And she just didn't want it. So I was like, okay, mama, thanks. And so I like put it back in this box and um, had every intention on taking it back. And then I forgot. Um, so the next year, Christmas rolls around. And I'm like, Brandon, I don't even know what to get that woman. You're going to have to figure out what to get her because I don't know how to please her. It's like, I know what she wants. So we went to Ollie's. Anybody y'all have an Ollie's near you, wherever you're watching from around the world? Good stuff, cheap. And so um, anyway, there's an Ollie's. And Brandon's like, I know exactly what to get her. And so here's the box right here. And he said, this is what she wants. Anybody ever seen these things? These are bed sheet clips that like clip the bed, the bed down to hold. <laughs> they were $1.50 and he's like, this is what she wants. I'm like, Brandon, we are not buying your grandma a dollar fifty present for Christmas. And he's like, I'm telling you, this is what she wants. And wouldn't you know, on Christmas morning, that woman was so excited over her little clips, her bed sheet clips. And you know, I think it's funny that a good gift giver will give you not what they want, but what you want. You ever been given like an elaborate gift by somebody um, and you can tell they spent a lot of money on it. It was, they're really excited to give it to you and you're like, oh, thanks. But it's not really what you like. It's not really your thing. It's more their thing. 
A good gift giver doesn't give you what they want. They give you, they know you intimately enough to know what you would want. And so I'm gonna ask you, what does God want? We spend so much energy and effort to do all these things for God. Does God want us to become New York Times bestselling authors? Does God want us to have mega churches? Does God want, I'm not saying any of these things are wrong in and of themselves, but for you, what does God want for you? Is it this one big thing? Is it this one big destiny? What does God want for you? I'm gonna tell you because he told us. John 21. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Jesus told him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked a question the third time, and he said, Lord, You know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. If you were to climb in the lap of God, which you should be doing as you study, and this is why I'm pretty convinced it's impossible to actually study and obey the word without teaching. That usually if there's a teaching problem, if there's a discipleship-making problem, it's rooted, listen, it's rooted in really not understanding who God is. It's going to God to to give him something we want, but not what he's asked because he's so plain. He says, if you love me, take care of those around you. Feed my sheep, love others. Love me and love others. If you climb in the lap of God, you are going to hear this. To seek, to save that which is lost. To seek, to save that which is lost. This is his heart. This is the heart of God. Do you hear his heart for humanity? Do you hear the heart of God that he loves you and he wants to put his gracious hand of God on you? He wants to put his gracious hand on your children and on your marriage and on your life and your calling. But listen, he's already given us everything we need and it's simple, it's not complicated. We've made it way too complicated. We just need to crawl in his lap to listen to his heart. And when he asks us to do something, we do it. Because we know he loves us. And then when we experience that, we share it with somebody else. This is a simple devotion to the Lord. This is the gospel. Ownership, personal ownership to be discipled and to make disciples. I want you to ask yourself, God, what are you speaking to me? God, what are you speaking to me? Would you close your eyes? Father, we hear you. God, we hear you. And we commit right now to reorienting our hearts to the simplicity of the gospel. Just to truly love you and to love others. The greatest commands to love you with all of our heart and to love our neighbor as ourself. You've made it so simple. It's simple devotion. And Father, we pray for heart transplants. God, we pray that you would make us feel what you feel and love like you love and care about what you care about, God, that we want to see you in here well done. When we look in your eyes and all of our life, It's flipped through like pages in a storybook, the narrative of our life. God, may the love of Jesus be written on every page. And God, we can't change yesterday, but we can certainly decide that from this day forward, we will choose, we will determine like Ezra to study, to obey, and to teach. To study, to obey, and to teach, to love those around us. The simple devotion, God. Your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. We're distracted by many things, but one thing is necessary to sit at your feet and to listen. And God, I pray for all of those in our sphere right now that you're calling us to mother. I pray for the spiritual orphans that are all around us. Those little melodies. But unless someone intervenes, 
Unless someone intervenes and cares enough to intervene, God, they may not be there a year from now. And I pray, Jesus, that you would call us to rise up and to listen and to see them and to have courage just to love people with the gospel of Jesus. And we thank you, God. We thank you. Thank you so much. And listen, we're going to take just a few minutes, and I know that you're gathering in homes, and even if you're by yourself right now, I want to encourage you to get these discussion questions. Something beautiful about unpacking, about taking truth and letting it marinate and spin in our hearts, and discussing it. When you discuss the truth with someone else, this is why breaking bread in our homes is so important. This is why this is how Christianity was birthed is because when I discuss with you what God is speaking to you, you see a side I didn't see. We discuss, even just talking and sharing, sometimes I'm able to make sense and sort what God has just been speaking in my heart. So I want to encourage you to spend a few minutes and talk to someone. If you're by yourself, call someone. Did you watch this? Can we talk about it? And to share and to journal what God is speaking in your life. There's some practical things God wants you to do with this message. Thank you so much for joining me. I cannot wait to hear your stories. I cannot wait to hear. I want you to send us an email. I want you to reach out. Tell me about the girls in your life you're reaching. We want to pray for them. We want to stand with you. I love you so much. Can't wait to see from see, see you again and to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. What a wonderful evening, what a wonderful word. I don't know about you guys, but when I approach the word of God and when I hear the word of God preached, I always leave being so full, but wanting something more. It's, it's kind of like Red Lobster biscuits. Like when you go to Red Lobster and you eat one of those biscuits, you know you really don't need to eat anymore, but you can't stop because they taste so good. And that is exactly how I feel about the Word of God, that we leave so full, but we just want more and more and more. And so ladies, we hope that you have been blessed through this evening. We want you to know that we're gonna continue to pray for you. If you've been blessed and want to continue to be involved with Arise, you can actually sign up to host your very own house party. We're gonna be doing this every month so you're going to have plenty of opportunities to bring your friends, your family in, and minister to them and share the love of Jesus with those around you. If Arise has been a blessing and you would like to partner with us as we share the gospel with women from around the world, you can actually partner with us financially by visiting arisewomensconference.com. Additionally, if you need prayer or you would like to share what God is doing in your life, what He's done in your house party, what He's done in your home. We want to hear about that. We want to rejoice with you. We want to pray with you. So please email us at amen at arisewomensconference.com so that we can join with you in prayer and in rejoicing. And we cannot wait to see what God continues to do through this ministry and what He continues to do through each of you as you are willing to open your homes to share the gospel of Jesus. We're praying for you. We know that God's going to do amazing things and we cannot wait to see you next next month.